Okay, so let's say that you have to set up a process in a factory. And in this factory, you're going to be moving some steel ingots. Yeah, the pallet full. Okay, and, and part of this is you're going to have to move these steel ingots to different parts of the plant. You're going to constantly keep going up different elevations, say at 45 degrees. So you have to move these up 45 degree angles uh, to get these to their storage as well as to their final workplace. And it's your job to figure out exactly how big of a device or a tow motor you're going to have to buy in order to make this motion efficiently without overpaying for anything. And you've got a few options something big something in the middle and something's considerably smaller how would you decide which one is the most appropriate this is professor cummings and in this video it's going to be part of our kinematics and dynamics series if you stay tuned we'll go through all the forces that you're going to take into account when you solve this kind of problem Hi, this is Professor Cummings, and I wanted to continue on this series on kinematics and dynamics. And in this one, I wanted to look at force. Uh, exactly what is a force, and how does it apply to the problem we brought up earlier? I'm trying to move a series of steel ingots on a pallet through a factory, and, and what kind of tow motor it would take to actually do the job. So let's just start off with, you know, let's step back from that and start off with this whole idea of a mass. So we've got a one kilogram mass and let's say we want to understand what's going on what forces are acting on that one kilogram mass so we take that one kilogram mass and we try to pick it up and there's something resisting us as we pick it up but we manage to pick it up and then we decide to let it go so what happens to this one kilogram mass well something is acting on it to drive it back to the ground now what's actually driving it down to the ground well it's acceleration acceleration due to gravity so acceleration due to gravity acts on everything on the on the face of the planet and it is really trying to pull everything to the center of the earth you know that ultimately that's what the acceleration of the gravity is doing everything is being driven to the center of the earth and it's happening at this acceleration rate of 9.81 meters per second squared so let's get this up and going so 9.81 meters per second squared are 32.2 feet per second squared so that's the acceleration that's acting on anything that you see and that acceleration due to gravity because it's got a mass is actually something we call a weight so it's the force due to gravity so you've got a mass you've got an acceleration in this case acceleration for gravity and that's what gives everything a weight so force is equal to the mass times the acceleration or F equals MA or your weight is equal to whatever your mass is times the acceleration due to gravity so since we can think of this force this weight as being pulled to the center of the earth one way we can describe force is either a push or a pull so force is a push or a pull and force requires acceleration and mass as you can see by Newton's second law so you have a mass and there's an acceleration acting on to you and that's what gives you a weight. Now one thing about Newton's law that I, I think is important to state is that when forces are unbalanced you have acceleration. So if the force on one side of an object is unbalanced or unopposed on the other side you actually see movement. When the forces are actually balanced you have something that stays at rest. So at equilibrium so our mass when it's sitting on the ground it's no longer moving it is known as being in equilibrium so right now as it sits here not going towards the center of the earth not floating into the sky it's actually in equilibrium so that force acting downward is being balanced by something else so what is balancing that force that everything has on it due to gravity see that we've got a weight and something must be opposing us well what is opposing us what's keeping us from going to the center of the earth is known as a normal force so all a normal force is is the force being applied upward in resistance to a force applied by an object or its weight and the only reason we call it normal is because 
that force is acting perpendicular to the object. So perpendicular is just another way of saying that it's normal. So we've got two forces and we can say that in the vertical direction that these forces are actually balanced. All right, so we've got a weight and we've got a normal force acting upwards. So what else is going on here? So let's go back to our problem. So we've got a pallet filled with steel and we wanna figure out what type of a tow motor would be appropriate in order to move that steel. So what are we basically saying? What's the, the whole purpose of that tow motor? Well, it is going to apply a force to the pallet. Now, that's another force that's gonna be acting on the object. It's called an applied force. So what is an applied force? All an applied force is, is a force that's imposed on an object by a prime mover. The prime mover can be you pushing on it, it could be you pulling on it with a rope, or it could be you using a forklift truck, or trying to drag it around the floor with, with a crane or a tow motor. So you've got an applied force on an object. So why is it that when you have an object, you know, say a piece of steel or a pallet full of steel, and a pallet that say is empty, why is it that it takes more force to push one or the other? If all the forces that we've talked about up to now are in the vertical direction, you've got a weight, and it's being counterbalanced by the normal force from the ground. You know, what forces, as you apply to that pallet, what is actually resisting you, and why is it that certain things you can move a lot easier than others? Well, there's another force that's being, uh, another thing that come into mind here was Newton's second law. Again, Newton's second law motion of motion states that a force acting on an object will change its velocity by changing either its speed or its direction. Okay, so again, what's stopping that applied force? What's that force should actually have a speed or a direction. So what, what is acting against it? Well, if there's another force that we need to take into account whenever we're trying to move an object, and that is friction. Now friction is the reason that, you know, it's, it's actually a resistance to a force, you know, between two surfaces. So it's the force exerted by, the, by a surface when an object moves across it. So it's just a resistance. So as you are trying to use that tow motor to push or pull an object there's going to be a friction that's going to be acting against you the friction can change why is it that you can you get more or less friction depending on the surface that you're on you don't if you were to move a bookcase or try to slide it across a carpet why is it different that same weight the same normal force acting up and you as the same person trying to apply a force why is it going to change when you try and push that that bookcase across a tile floor versus a carpet well, there's another another variable to take into account, and it's called the coefficient of friction. So according to another technical definition, the ratio between force necessary to move one surface against another and the pressure between the two surfaces. So what does that mean? It's the condition of the surfaces that you're trying to push, or the dis condition of those two surfaces as they interact together. So if you've got two surfaces, you're gonna have a coefficient of friction that might prohibit you more in one than versus in another. And there's two types of coefficient of friction. There's a coefficient of friction that's known as the static coefficient of friction and a coefficient of friction known as the kinetic coefficient of friction. The static coefficient of friction is what keeps you still and what you have to overcome in order to break out of uh, being at rest. And the kinetic coefficient of friction is the resistance you're gonna feel even when you're in motion. So what it takes to overcome something sitting still versus what it takes to actually keep it in movement. And why is it that, and you could take two different pallets or two pallets with the same material on the same floor, one filled with, with more weight versus one that's practically empty and get two different types of frictional force to resistance you is because these horizontal, these vertical forces are actually somehow playing into the friction. So how does it play into friction? Well you look at it this way you got that coefficient of friction times the normal force gives you your frictional force so the frictional force what's coming back is a function of not only the condition of the surfaces but the normal force being applied from the ground so the force that's acting on the surface that you're in contact with notice it's the normal force and not the weight so it's the force that's acting upward 
against the surface that you're actually meeting, the two surfaces that you're meeting, and the condition of those surfaces that gives your coefficient of friction and the normal force. So now we've got four different forces. We've got an applied force. We're going to signify that with the letter P, variable P. We've got a weight, known by W, a frictional force, which is F sub F, and a normal force. Now let's look at something else. So in, in our original problem, I said that, that the pallets were going to have to go through 45 degree angles. So there's going to be several ramps, several conditions where there's 45 degree angles. So let's give an angle to our applied force. So let's say we've got some sort of mass, we're pushing on it and we're pushing downward at an angle. So we're leaning into this thing and kind of going downwards. So keep in mind that force is a vector. And since it's a vector, it has got a magnitude and a direction. So that means that it's going to have a horizontal and a vertical component to it. Okay, vertical component to it. So as we look at this applied force, and we consider that angle theta that I mentioned before, which was 45 degrees, but we just call it theta for now. We're going to have to break this up into a vertical and a horizontal component to that force. And what this is going to end up looking like is you're going to have the applied force times the sine of theta going in the vertical direction and the applied force times the cosine of theta going in the horizontal direction. So now we've got all the forces, we've got a weight going in the vertical, a normal force going to the vertical, a frictional force going to the horizontal, and we've got an applied force at an angle, but we can break this up into horizontal and vertical with the sine and cosine of theta. So now we've got all our forces broken up into a variety of, of, of vertical and horizontal components. So now what are we going to do with, with all this information? Well. They're, very, they're, they're vectors, so we actually have to start to do our sum of our, our forces using vector addition. So we don't really have to worry about what the applied force is since we've broken it up into components. And now let's do our vector addition. So we're going to have to break this up into vertical and horizontal components and start summing them up that way. So we'll start with the vertical. What all is acting in the vertical direction? So we'll give it uh, since they're vectors, we'll give these things a coordinate system so we can know what sign, so we can you know, point out which directions are acting which. So there we gave it a coordinate system. So we're going to say that going up is in the positive, going down is negative, going to the right is positive, going left is negative. So what all is acting when we sum these up? Sum them up in the vertical. So we can say the sum of all the forces in the vertical direction, in the y direction, up being positive, is mass times acceleration in the y or the normal force minus the weight since it's negative minus the vertical component of the applied force p times the sine of theta so the sum of all the forces that are acting vertically is just the normal force minus the weight p times times minus the cosine of the p times the sine of theta so that's the sum of forces in the vertical direction the sum of forces in the horizontal direction is very similar since we know it's positive in the, to the right. F equals MA in the X direction. So we know that what's going on in the right is P times the cosine of theta and it's directly opposed by the amount of friction or the frictional force is equal to the coefficient of friction times the normal which gives us this equation here. So that's the sum of the forces in the horizontal and the vertical. Now let's look at these two equations and you can see that certain things are showing up in both. The normal force seems to play in both the horizontal and the vertical and the applied force plays in the horizontal and vertical. And we've also got two equations and two unknowns. So this is one of the ways that we're, you know, a very important aspect of actually solving these kinds of problems. So let's look at how we would actually go through the solution. Let's, let's lay this out a little more plain to see a little more systematically, break it up into steps. So if we're actually gonna solve this problem, so now we've got a pallet and we're trying to figure out what type of tow motor would be appropriate to move this. 
So we're trying to figure out what would the applied force actually be in this particular case. But we could also be looking for any number of these different variables. Okay, but we just said we're looking for the applied force. How we go about approaching this? Well, the first thing you want to do is establish what is given. So we've got a free body diagram. We want to set up a free body diagram. We want to start figuring out everything that was given to us in this free body diagram. We may or may not have been given a mass. In this case, we weren't given an applied force, but if we were, we'd want to make note of that. Our coefficient of friction, any angles, and in some cases, we might want to know what the times are and the accelerations so we can maybe work back using our kinematic equations to figure out other aspects of this problem. But we want to write down everything that we were given. Next, we want to establish what are the unknowns? What weren't we given? Or what are we actually trying to find? What were we looking for? We want to set up a coordinate system. So we want to be able to say, you know, what is going in the positive direction? and what is going in the negative direction. Okay, so we wanna set up a coordinate system so we can do our vector summation. The next thing we wanna do is we wanna actually sum the forces, and then we wanna solve for what actually is unknown. Okay, so now we solve for what's unknown, and in this particular case, that unknown would be which tow motor can apply, applied forces, enough force to move my steel. So this is Professor Cummings. If this video was helpful to you, go ahead and, and share it uh, or subscribe. Also leave me a comment, give me some kind of feedback so I can improve on future videos. Uh, you, uh, there's, like, this is a part of a series of kinematic drawings, kinematic uh, equations and dynamic. So, you know, this is gonna be part of a playlist, a bigger playlist. Uh, like I said, go ahead and subscribe and thanks for watching my video and you can also get in touch with me on Facebook, Twitter and Google Plus at the Engineers Reference. Thanks a lot.